um, I would like to welcome everyone to um, this webinar and to all of you for the first London Art Week Winter Talk in association with the Royal Norwegian Embassy in London and the Nordic Institute of Art, whose dedicated mission is to stimulate the research and promotion of historical and modern art from the Nordic countries in an international context. My name is Anthony Crichton Stewart, and I'm a director of Ag News London. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Knut Jurgert, the head of the Nordic Institute of Art and author of Peder Balke, Sublime North. The original plan was to launch his new book at the Ambassador's Residence in London, but due to COVID, we are having our first virtual book launch with an introduction to the book and Peter Balka by Knut, followed by a panel discussion with Christopher Riepel, the Neil Westreich curator of post-1800 paintings at the National Gallery in London, Marcus Marshall from Daxer and Marshall in Munich, and William Mitchell from John Mitchell Fine Paintings in London. Knut is a Norwegian art historian and a recognized scholar on Nordic and European 19th and 20th century art. He was formerly <coughs> director of the Northern Norway Art Museum, as well as a curator of the National Gallery of Norway. In 2019 and 2020, he curated the exhibition, Edward Byrne Jones, the Pre-Raphaelites in the North, together with Alison Smith, which was shown in Stockholm and Bergen. In 2014-15, he co-curated with Christopher Riepel the exhibition Peter ba Peder Balka, Vision and Revolution at the Northern Norway Art Museum and the National Gallery London. The Norwegian painter Peder Balka is perhaps one of the most enigmatic artists of the Nordic Romantic movement. His landscapes are often small and monochromatic and painted with a Gothic intensity that belies any attempt at naturalism. They are mystical and often tempestuous and seemingly painted without careful finish. If peopled at all, it is only to emphasize the power of nature and the heroic North. So without further ado, may I now hand you over to Knut to introduce his book. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you, Anthony, for your uh, kind introduction. I'm very grateful to the London Art Week and to Silke Lohmann for organizing this event, and also to the Norwegian Embassy in London for the collaboration. Uh, thank you also to the participants in this panel. I'm, of course, happy to be here in online, would not, as Anthony mentioned, this should have been a real event in London, I would have preferred that to see you all, but under the present circumstances, I'm very happy we can do this at all. And here is the book. Can you all see me and the book? This is the so book we are going to talk more about today. Uh, this would have been the advantage of being with you. Uh, just briefly show you one open page. So, shall we go to the slideshow? Is the slides on? Yeah. Yes, good. Next, next picture, please. So, the book, Peter Balke, Sublime North, is published by Skira Editore in association with Nordic Institute of Art this fall. And as the title states, it presents uh, the works of the Gundersen collection, 53 works. So it's the largest collection of Balkis work in the world. And it also contains a monographic presentation of Balkis as a painter with major works from museums and other collection. And I think it is probably the largest monograph on Balke up to date. I mean, the last one was the book that Chris and I did together with Marit Lange at the National Gallery in 2014. 
And just a few words on the Gunnarsson collection. Um, Gun Paul Gunnarsson is a Norwegian collector who has been collecting essentially Norwegian art for decades. Edward Munch, yes, very nice, very fine collection of Munch prints of, and Norwegian folk art, and then also Peder Balke. So the red thread is really Norwegian art. And um, it has been, I think it's interesting, you know, we, the, the, I think we will hear more about it later during uh, this uh, in the panel session, uh, which part many collect, different collectors have played in bringing uh, Balki back into the lim limelight. Uh, after his death in 1887, Balki was completely forgotten and was rediscovered here in Norway only at the beginning of the 20th century. And it is as late as the last decade or so that he has recognized the international acclaim. <clears throat> and I would, before I go, into the works of Peter Balke, I would like to, to thank the Gunnarsson Collection for collaborating on this book. And in particular to the Gunnarsson Collection's uh, curator, Martin Sontag, and also to the team at Skira. So, 1832. The young Norwegian painter Peter Balke, who was born in 1804, traveled to the northernmost part of Norway, all the way up to North Cape, which we see here and which was considered the northernmost part of Norway at the time, or, or Europe, sorry. Very dramatic, highly romantic, and uh, very staged, you might say. Still, this is when he still is a certain, is to a certain degree, a naturalist painter. And then, why did he go to the north? There have been a few painters there before him, not many, and no Norwegians. The Norwegian painters of the, of the time settled for the southern parts of Norway, for the mountains of mid-Norway and the west coast, which was considered perhaps the most national. North Norway wasn't really on the artistic map. So Balke, a part of Balke's importance is the fact that he traveled there himself. He saw this firsthand. Uh, next image. I think we should talk then to understand him a bit about his background. He was born, as mentioned, in 1804 uh, in the countryside of Norway, came from a rather poor background, and had his original training as a painter's apprentice in a Norwegian village. So house decoration, essentially. Uh, his talents were recognized by local well-to-do farmers and landowners. He was sent into the capital of Norway Christiania, or Oslo, as it's named today, attending the Royal Drawing School in the late 1820s. But he realized he needed to further his education. So he went on to Stockholm. Uh, Norway was at that point in a union with Sweden. But most Norwegian artists still preferred to go to Copenhagen and then on to the continent. So it was quite an original choice that Balke went to Stockholm. And he was, in periods, the student of this artist, Carl Johan Falkrans, who is the most important landscape painter of Sweden of the Romantic period. And I think it's important to stress Falkrans' importance because in posterity has not treated him nicely. He is often seen as a marginal artist, but he was very important in Scandinavia as a teacher, but also as the first real landscape painter of Sweden. I mean, there have been landscapes before, obviously, but he established this as a genre. And he was interested in the Nordic, or Scandinavian landscape, unlike most artists before him who traveled to Italy, painting classic landscapes, classical landscapes. And he traveled also to Norway. We, so this is a Norwegian landscape we see here from the West Coast, some if you would, with what was considered to be ancient Viking tombs. But I think also we should stress the importance of Falkrans as Balkis' first teacher, which is something I do enlarge upon in the book, and which has also been not focused upon earlier. Uh, 
but if you look at uh, his interest in the dark landscape, I think the term you used, Anthony Gothic, is quite interesting in that context. The colors, you will see the colors are also relevant to some of Balkus' earlier works. So the mood, the, 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 the romantic mood uh, of the landscapes. So we have next image. Balke was what we can call a traveling artist. He traveled widely all over Europe, first in his own country to the north, but also all over Europe to, to gain uh, commissions, to sell his works, but ori intentionally, originally to, to gain uh, an education. And he realized he needed to go to Europe. The obvious choice was to go to Dresden, where the famous Norwegian artist Johann Christian Dahl had settled as a professor and where he was a close friend of Caspar David Friedrich and his circle of German romantics. So I show you this painting by relatively early painting by Dahl, a Norwegian landscape from 1827, painted the year after his first uh, tour of his native country in 1826 and belongs to the National Gallery. It was a gift from uh, Aspen Lunde, the collector, who also was very important in the context of Pede Balke and, and uh, bringing Pede Balke back into the limelight. Now, Balke writes about his relation to Dahl. Uh, Dahl urges him to study nature. Dahl was a relatively naturalist artist for the Romantic period. The study of nature was at the core, and Balke really worked hard to, to attempt to fulfill Dahl's ideal about naturalist studies, but it wasn't really in his character as an artist. And, and of course, he in Dresden, he learned more about uh, the romantic, the visionary romanticism of Caspar David Friedrich, more distance from real life, which we shall see later. Shall we have next image? So <clears throat> we are jumping a bit in time and geography here. Balke traveled to the north in 1832. And I'd just like to remind you about how the north was considered. The north, that was a dark and really scary, dangerous place. And that was a very established tradition, as you can see from this map, one of the earliest visual, depic visual depictions of Scandinavia, Carta Marina by Olaus Magnus, first edition printed in Venice in 1539. And as you can see, Scandinavia is surrounded by sea, filled with sea monsters and other strange creatures. And left in the map, you can see a, a small island called Tile. That is, of course, a reference to Thule, Ultima Thule, Thule at the end of the world. And Balke traveled all the way up north to, to what you can see, Finnmark and the North Cape without meeting any monsters. But this idea of the north as dangerous, that stuck well into the Romantic period and it suited the Romantic period well with ideals of the sublime emerging in the 18th century we can have the next image. That's a painting by the French painter, Francois Auguste Billard, who traveled to not only the northernmost part of Norway, but also to the Arctic, to, to Spitsbergen, Svalbard, in 1839 on a scientific uh, expedition, French expedition. And I think this image, beautiful image of Northern Lights, reflects the two different aspects that also uh, about the northernmost landscape that also uh, was a consequence to Balkia. Namely, one, the expectations they had about the North as a place of the sublime, of danger, but beautiful danger, that had stuck in people's mind. You know, if you read romantic literature like the Gothic novel, 
Frankenstein by Mary Shelley that actually opens in the Arctic. But at the same time, this is the time artists and others start to travel up to the north on a more regular basis. You had several expeditions through the 19th century. And one of the earliest was the mentioned Rochelle's expedition. So Bial's works are based both on first-hand observations, but also on the romantic ideal about what the North should be about. And I think that also goes for Pedro Belkia. We can have the next image. This is a drawing, uh, probably executed during his normal travel in 1832. Belkia left his memoir, left us his memoirs, so his Travel is well described, his journey up to the north, uh, by foot up to Trondheim and by ship along the coast, often surprised by hurricanes, bitten by mosquitoes under the midnight sun. This is really, you know, to be, to be a, a landscape painter back then was really tough, in particular if you wanted to discover uh, new landscapes, which was what Balke did. But most of his landscapes, we can have the next image. Most of his landscapes are not a far away from naturalist depictions. They are landscapes of memory in the romantic visionary tradition uh, where the landscape becomes something representing another dimension. And almost as an icon in his works, we find the North Cape Plateau, uh, considered to be the northernmost part of Europe. Here ends the world, and beyond there you have the wide ice sea up to Spitsbergen and the North Pole. Of course, there had been other artists there before him, as mentioned, the Swedish artist Schöldebrand around 1800, then later the Bavarian artist Christian Estorff. The Balke was the first Norwegian, and he really made his own interpretations in this romantic mood and this landscape came to follow him all through his artistic career. So we can have the next uh, picture perhaps. Yes. So here we see, um, here we see the Monday view of Greifswald by Caspar David Friedrich and I think it's pretty obvious to see where Balke found his inspiration for his mood landscapes. But interesting enough, Friedrich and the Germans' works are moonlight landscapes, night landscapes, while Balke's la night landscapes are, of course, observed under the midnight sun. So there is a difference, but in his interpretation, they become, he, he sort of adapts the dress and romantic. Uh, image to the northernmost landscapes. And <clears throat> of course, uh, Balkin knew very well about Friedrich's work. He writes about Friedrich in a letter home that he considered him one of the most important German painters of the time. It's unclear whether they met because he writes that he's old and ill and he cannot see people, but he definitely knew his works very well. So next image, please. And here we have another view of the North Cape. And here we are, this belongs, as you can see, to the Museo de Louvre in Paris. In the late 1840s, Peter Balke stayed in Paris he traveled widely, always on the lookout for commissions. And he somehow, he managed to get an, an audience with the king of the French, Louis Philippe, through really his, mostly his own efforts. He, he wrote a letter, the Swedish Norwegian ambassador turned it down, said, said, no, we can't use that. So he went through the back door, so to speak. He used an inspector at the Room Museum to hand over the letter. And then he was actually called for a meeting uh, with, with, with the king. And they spent several days together. And they, because Balkin knew something that was important, 
namely that Louis Philippe, as a young prince in exile, had traveled to the northernmost part of Norway. He had been to the North Cape. So the king uh, found his old map. They looked at where he had traveled. And this resulted first in the king commissioning two paintings. This is one of them, the North Cape, with the king and his entourage in the foreground. And then later, he commissioned a series of sketches of studies, 30 something, uh, from which he was to choose a series of large scale paintings. So Balke delivered them, and uh, most of them are preserved in the Museo de Louvre, still on show there. So this was, you know, finally Balke, who had been a struggling artist, uh, was about to get his international breakthrough. But alas, new revol revolution, 1848, revolution came along and Balke fled Paris, went back home, went to Dresden and then uh, to London. We will, we will get back to that. So he lost that commission and didn't get his international breakthrough. But this was at the time he started to develop the way of painting we connect with Peter Balke today. Um, you know, the sort of monographic uh, scale. And as we can see in this beautiful uh, and major work, Vade Fortress, also at the northernmost parts of Norway, you know, we see the monographic scale, gray brownish, a bit of uh, bluish hues uh, in the background, green bluish. And also note, uh, please note the little orange stripe in the background in the horizon. This is not the best uh, image I could find, but should do. And also very typical of his technique is he grounded the, 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 the canvas with paint, white paint, and then he added very thin layers of paint in different colors, as you can see here. And then he brushed them away with, well, the, for, to create the effect of waves, he probably used a very brown brush to create the sky or the clouds, he might have used a sponge or with the clouds. Sometimes he would use a, his palette knife or just his fingers. And he, he added, as you will see, see later, more and more sparingly color. So this is a very, he starts here really to experiment with the way to depict this landscape. And of course, we can trace in his way of painting his background as a decoration painter, because these were techniques used also in craftsmanship at the time to you know, imitate marble or wood. But what is surprising is the way he uses it in a, a, a landscape painting. I would also like to mention before we go to the next uh, picture that this is a very important work in the reception history of Balke, because Balke was really forgotten after his death in 1887 and only rediscovered here in Norway at the anniversary of Jubilee exhibition in 1814 when we celebrated our constitution's centennial. And this painting was acquired by Kode, the art museums uh, of Bergen, as it's known today, it was then you know, named Bergen Art Museum or Art Society of Bergen probably. And they bought it uh, as early as in 1914. So that was the first major acquisition made by a Norwegian museum, several years after Balke's death. Next image, please. And that brings me over to his stay in London because the French King, Louis Philippe, he fled to England, where Queen Victoria put a mansion at his disposal, uh, where he lived for the rest of his life. And Balke traveled to London, trying to get a meeting with the king uh, to persuade him to fulfill the commission, which of course was not possible. But Balke stayed something like a year and a half in London. And we know that Balke, he was an artist who frequently visited exhibitions and museums, both historical uh, collections, but also contemporary exhibitions. 
uh, and I find it very likely he must have gone to the Royal Academy's exhibitions this year, two years. The Royal Academy was at that time housed in uh, the building of the National Gallery in Trafalgar Square, your, your place, Chris. And this is a work that Turner exhibited in 1849. Of course, there are obvious parallels between what Balke and Turner attempt to do. You know, they both uh, were, uh, struggle with the atmospheric, how to capture that, and they use highly experimental ways of uh, depicting that. But also, I think, the use of colors, the monochro almost monochrome scale of colors, and then the surprise thing, addition of some very strong hues like the red orange hue on the, as we can see on the sail of the sail ship here in Thomas painting. And as we often see in the background of, of Balkus paintings as a stripe in the horizon. And of course, Turner has been mentioned as a source of inspiration before, but I think we are at least we are getting slightly closer to that. And that is also something I have attempted to, uh, to investigate in the book. So next image. Yes, yes. Balkia, yeah, as mentioned, he started as a decoration painter. And some of the first things he did after he had studied in Stockholm was to go back to his native village, Tuten on Hedmarken, or well, where he had grown up, and where he painted uh, the houses, painted, he painted landscape scenes on, on the walls of the houses of some of his early patrons, his early supporters. And this was actually something he continued to do later in life, painting uh, wall paintings on murals. So he was never above that. I think he saw that as a integrated part of his artistic oeuvre. And this is probably among the latest, or very likely among the latest, done around 1860 for a manor house uh, outside of Tunsberg in southwest Norway. But even if it's in the south of Norway, it's a landscape from northern Norway. He always returned to the northern landscape. And we can see here, he this, this becomes very characteristic for him in the 60s. He leaves more and more of the white background open, adds paint very sparingly. We can have the next painting. You can see how he has done that also in this iconic painting, Mount Stertin, uh, where we see this mountain, you know, appear almost as in a vision or a dream in the fog in the background, it has just scraped away uh, the, the blue-gray hues that's there to indicate the fog to, to, to make the mountain or the snow on the top of the mountain peak appear in the background. And the effort is really magical. And that also we can have the next, also an iconic work. This is in the Gundersen collection and on the cover of the book, Lighthouse in Mist. Uh, and you know, this is, if it, you know, I, I'm sure you will, will enlarge on this, Chris, but when you see a work like this, you understand why people, somebody would like to see Balke as a predecessor of the modernist. If you remove the lighthouse, you could almost have a rough go. Yeah. But the, the effect is really creates a really stunning mood, magic mood with this lighthouse hovering above the sea. Next image, please. Yes. Balke, in spite of having important patrons like the, the kings of Sweden and Norway, and later the king of the French, and others, other people, uh, he was never really accepted by the Norwegian art community of the time. And around the mid 19th century, he stopped exhibiting altogether. He received really nasty critics, pieces of criticism, but he continued to paint on his own for himself. Alongside, he was running a business, he had a political commitment, but he painted 
for his own pleasure. And most of these paintings, late paintings, they are very small in size. Very often they are in black and white monochromes. So they are painted white and then added just a little layer of black, which he then scrapes away. And here again, he returns to the North Cape. And I think that was very interesting with the exhibition we did, Chris, in 2014-15, that we, we showed so many of these late, small black and white paintings. And that has also been very interesting to, to work closely with the Gunderson collection, because this is where the strength of that collection lies with more than 30 of these late paintings. You can have the next image. And also the National Gallery has one of those, the Tempest from, well, it says here 1862, we might probably say around the 1870s. We can have the next image again. Yes, this is beautiful, uh, piece of warm lights. And here we see, again, his, his wonderful technique, adding paint, uh, black paint. And I know I'm out of my time, I'm soon wrapping up, uh, adding paint. And then it seems to create the effect of northern lights appear in, on, on the, in the sky. He has almost, he might have used his fingernails to scrape away the paint or, or, or an old comb or something. But it's really like a, a vision. And remember, this is painted probably in the 1870s. The artist isolated in the studio several, more than 30 years after his visit to North Norway. So these are really the memories, landscapes of memory. And let us also remember, this, these are painted at the same time as for instance, the Impressionist works appear in Paris. Can we have the next work? Yes, another example of that. The Hearn Family Trust in New York. Also where you see similar technique, scraping away to create the effect of northern lights. But he had been in North Norway during the summer. So he couldn't have seen the northern lights there, or very unlikely. He could have seen a pale version of it in the southern parts of Scandinavia, or he could have imagined it, dreamt about it, probably a combination. But more, it's really more, more of a vision. And we can have the last painting. Then also, Pat, in his very late years, he returns to the pale color scale now adding even more sparingly to it with colors, just a few dots of green in the, in the foreground to indicate nature and blue in the sky. And well, there are so many ideas that uh, runs through my mind when I see something like this. Uh, it has been compared to Chinese Turkish paintings. Could they have seen that? We don't know, uh, perhaps. You, you can say something on that, Chris. However, as I mentioned, when Pedro Balke died in 1887, he was completely forgotten as an artist. And only rediscovered here in Norway in 1814 and you know, more and more known on the Norwegian art scene during the 20th century. But it's only in the 21st century that uh, he has received international recognition. And well, this concludes my talk, my introduction. And it brings me to the next speaker, which is you, Chris. Christopher Riopel, <clears throat> Neil Westreich curator of post 1800 paintings at the National Gallery, a great scholar of the Romantic movement, as well as a great friend of Nordic art. Uh, Chris has initiated and curated, among other exhibitions, the National Gallery's 2010 exhibition on the Danish Golden Age painter Christian Kabke, as well as a show on Swiss and Norwegian landscape paintings from the Aspen Lunde collection in 2011. In 2014, Chris and I collaborated on the Balke exhibition that was shown both in Tromsø and in London. 
And we are also honored to count Chris as an associate fellow of the Nordic Institute of Art. And Chris, I would like to, uh, shall we say, kickstart you with a question. How come do you think uh, that an artist like Per de Balke re received recognition in his native Norway only posthumously, that is during the 20th century, and internationally as late as the last decade or so? Over to you, Chris. Thank you, thank you, Knut, for uh, those comments, and it's a wonderful brings back wonderful memories of our working together on the on the exhibition of of 2014. I think that um, Belka's failure to to uh, confirm his fame in his own lifetime is is uh, fascinating uh, evidence. He was a failed painter in a certain sense in his own mind, in that he publicly gave up. Uh, uh, painting turned to these smaller, uh, later things, and it was only as the slow realization, as you say, beginning in 1914, the slow realization of how unique they are that has led to this, what has been quite a slow, but now speeding up uh, process, increasingly international, uh, of his achievement. And I want to say about my, a little bit about my first exposure, exposures, uh, to Balka, which came very quickly, bang, 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 uh, beginning in the spring of 2009 with the uh, wonderful exhibition of his works at Ordre Guard in the context of uh, Zaha Hadid's extraordinary contemporary building there. And I was very puzzled. I didn't know what to make, particularly of these uh, strange late black and white uh, works sometimes just on lumps of, of wood, very obdurate, seemingly uh, unfinished, but I was, I was puzzled, I was intrigued, I wanted to know more. Very soon after that um, came my first meeting with Asborn Lunde, visiting him at the apartment in, um, in New York, seeing the paintings covering the walls and also piled up against the walls eight and nine deep. Uh, and asking Osborne then if we couldn't uh, make an exhibition for London of uh, two parts of, of his collection that seemed to speak to each other so well, that is the Norwegian landscape paintings and the absolutely contemporary Swiss paintings, <coughs> and to see how those two traditions um, worked, um, sp spoke to one another so powerfully. And then third, so I knew when Asborn agreed that uh, we could do the exhibition of his collection that we would be able for the first time to show Balka, because he had such wonderful ones, uh, show Balka in the context uh, of the National Gallery. Then the third hit, as it were, wonderfully, uh, was I got a call soon after from um, Danny Katz uh, saying, why don't you drop by? I dropped by. Uh, he had spread three small late um, uh, Balkas on his desktop, and he said with his usual laconic style, so pick one. And so that is how a Balka, this Balka you see on the screen, entered uh, the National Gallery collection. So very quickly, we were able to show him permanently, and this is a painting hanging with our other landscape oil sketches that I cannot help but note always attracts the attention, particularly of young people. They go straight to it and want to know what, what is it? Um, how, why does it look like this? And I think that uh, is one of the intriguing aspects of, of Balka. But let me go back to that first exhibition in, uh, that I saw in Ordre Guard. It was not principally the work of um, uh, Denmark. It was, it rather had begun in at the Kunsthalle in Krems in Austria, where it was curated uh, by the contemporary uh, art historian Dieter Buchart. Dieter Buchart, whose field in contemporary are, are uh, Jean Michel Basquiat and Keith Herring, two artists associated with graffiti, associated with the ephemeral, associated with strange, deeply personal uh, imagery. And it is Dieter who does the first exhibition in the world of Belka outside of 
um, outside of uh, the Nordic countries. And I think that that bringing of a modernist, a contemporary aesthetic to bear that Dieter does, particularly on the late works, bringing to bear his, uh, his sense of uh, of modernity as something contingent, always changing. He's, he often quotes in his work Strindberg, who at the end of his essay on painting said, the art of the future, which will pass away like everything else, like graffiti art, uh, imitate nature closely, above all, imitate nature's way of creating. That is to allow chance. And I think in so many of these late paintings, that is what Balk is doing. He's allowing the paint, thin paint, as, as Knut says, running across these hard surfaces. And I think he allows it to run until it begins to suggest something to him, most often the sea. And it's at that point when chance has given him the image, this deeply modern uh, conception, uh, that that's when, as it were, Velka strikes, uh, adds the sinking ship, uh, adds the rocks, adds the bird in the sky to turn this image created by chance into something uh, extremely <coughs> powerful, evocative, modern. Now, uh, whereas the exhibition we're talking about in um, uh, in uh, Copenhagen was uh, was called a uh, Nordic pioneer of modernism, uh, Dieter very interestingly called the exhibition in German. Ein Pionier der Moderna, no mention of Norway. He was interested in thinking about uh, Balka in an international context. And Ein Pionier, that is one of many, that part of a project which has been so fascinating in the last 20, 30 years of finding those people who were contributing to a new way of looking, a new way of image making, uh, it, beginning in the middle of the 19th century. We for so long concentrated on the French innovations, but clearly in the Nordic countries, uh, a deep experimentation was going on with Balka, with Strindberg, with other people really thinking, uh, thinking through what modern painting was going to be in an entirely different way uh, from, the, uh, from the French. Uh, and that is what I find so fascinating in, um, uh, in this revival, or not even a revival, it's, it's, it's this new interest in, um, uh, in Balka is that we are gaining an insight into the sheer complexity of the modernist experiment and how these outriders, which we must call him this real estate developer and politician in Oslo, uh, suddenly creating these, these extraordinary image, what they were adding uh, to this great, great project. And so it was so much fun and such a great uh, pleasure to work with Knut on the exhibition that then opened in uh, Tromsø in June of 2014 before coming to London at the end of the year. I, I remember it very well. I remember particularly uh, a, a, an amazing dinner out in the countryside where we all uh, arose from the table, those of us still able to arise, at 4.30 in the morning, but the sun had never set, so uh, it didn't make any difference. Uh, but I know that another person here who remembers that very well is Marcus Marshall. He was, he was with us. It was a great reunion of Balka people, our, our band of brothers, as it were. Uh, and so I'd like to pass on to Marcus and ask him what role he thinks, and clearly it is a very important one, what role he thinks uh, the art dealers have had in presenting this new artist to the public. You're muted, Marcus. Hello. Um, hello, my name is Marcus Marshall. Thank you, Chris, for handing over to me and um, yeah, let me try to um, sum up a few thoughts uh, on that. Um, I think generally the role of a dealer is to um, have an ear on the rail, as we say in German. I don't know whether it's an expression in English. It means that you um, 
are aware of a new trend, train, trend coming before other people do. And um, I think that's uh, part of art dealing is exactly that because um, a new trend means to look, uh, to find a new perspective uh, for art that has been around, but to find a new perspective on it. And it also means that uh, from a financial point of view, which is important for a dealer as well, um, you try to find um, areas that have not been um, in focus so much before because uh, then uh, it's easier to find a very good works of art. So I think that's what exactly what, what happened here. And um, it, as, I mean, the, the focus on Scandinavian art, um, I think, um, started in Denmark, really. <clears throat> and um, it was uh, the Danish painters, Eckersberg and the School of Copenhagen, the so-called Golden Age painters, that were um, first um, on, on an international view in the 1990s, starting in the 90s, and um, <clears throat> people became interested, curators became interested at first. And um, uh, I remember speaking to people in America about golden age paintings and um, curators that said they loved them, but their director would not, um, would never um, okay uh, buying one because nobody knows what that is and so on and so forth. And um, it took a while until Artemis um, uh, sort of paved the way, the uh, London art dealers, Artemis, they were among the first to actually publish a catalog on Danish art. And, um, and then some people sort of were attracted and interested. I remember uh, speaking to uh, John Loeb, the ambassador to Denmark, American ambassador to Denmark, um, in the 80s, and um, John, who has um, quite a quite lovely um, collection of mostly Danish paintings, um, said to me, and I'll tell you the story because it's so amusing, he said, well, you know, sometimes the weekends in Copenhagen when I was an ambassador were so boring, and what I used to do is I went to the uh, museum and I took a little um, piece of paper and a pencil with me and I wrote down the names um, of painters I saw and liked in the gallery. And then I used to go to the sales in Copenhagen and I would sit in the first row and see the paintings and look on my little list. And when a name came up that was on my list, I raised my hand. Mm -hmm. So um, this is how he started <laughs> to collect. <laughs> Danish paintings, and then others followed. Asbjörn Lunde, obviously, probably with um, more in-depth and more connoisseurship um, than the start of um, uh, John Loeb, although he became uh, very accomplished in the end. And um, um, I mean, these were interesting days. You could find um, amazing works and um, uh, Wilhelm Hammerscheu was about 10% of what it is today. And uh, um, you could buy uh, in the first row. And then when that sort of reached an international market, um, we, uh, as dealers, we looked into other fields in Scandinavia. And um, this is actually when um, I found... Um, um, that was when I was introduced to Peter Balke, and this was um, in 2003, 2004, maybe 2002. I think I saw him the first time, and um, it, for me as a, a German, it fitted in, of course, with um, Dresden landscape painting. It fitted in with Friedrich. It fitted in with Dahl, who spent most of his life in Dresden, and who by the Dresdners is considered, of course, a German romanticist. Um, uh, Thomas Fernley, all these people, there were all these links and contacts and connections. And um, so I, I got very interested in that. And I, as many others, were, I was extremely taken by Balke, whom, who had, in my point of view, um, a position 
quite unique within these painters. And you could somehow see that this was something different, um, different in a way that um, you could sense that he maybe not had the amount of academic training or the restraints of an academic training at an early stage, but you could see somebody who was very much on his own, um, free in using techniques, free in creating motifs, uh, free in applying paint. And he, was, he was just not, yes, I, I think that's maybe the word and Chris commented on it. He um, had very special ways of um, painting, also technically he had very special ways. And um, I think I then bought my first uh, Balke in 2004 and, um, or 2003. And um, mm, this is here now where I would like to switch to, um, this was the dealer's uh, 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 perception. And um, I would also like to, to say something about um, collector's um, view on, uh, on this market. And um, I remember well when I um, exhibited the first uh, Balke in 2003 or 2004 on uh, the Tefa Fair, the International Fair uh, for um, Old Masters and um, uh, Great Art Fair. Um, people would be immediately attracted to these paintings um, and ask what they were and what and this and that. And, um, and, but people had a hard time to actually buy them. They were not um, cheap at the time either. They cost some money and nobody knew the artist. Um, but interestingly enough, um, uh, then Scandinavian buyers uh, jumped in because they had, their idea was that if Balke suddenly would be on the international market, that that would probably raise the prices, bring interest. And so people um, uh, jumped in uh, that actually knew the artist and, um, and started buying them. And then um, other people did as well. And um, I remember um, what helped me enormously to convince people that didn't know the artist was um, this little book here. And it's um, quite an amusing book um, written by an artist. It's by Per Kierkeby and he wrote it, the modern, the painter Per Kierkeby and he wrote it in 1996. And it's about um, his or one of his favorite artists and um, Guess who that is? It's Peter Balke. And um, it was quite interesting for me to see how this, especially also with people interested in the 20th century and 20th century art, uh, that did it. They, um, they thought um, that sort of gave them context and it added to their um, uh, perception of the modernity that these paintings um, had for them. And um, uh, so uh, slowly it, it, it came on. And then, of course, there was a big boost when uh, international exhibitions started and things like that happened. And um, um, but probably uh, before I finish, I would like to. Um, maybe comment on, 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 on one thing that um, I find sometimes a bit irritating, and that is that a lot of people um, see Peter Balke as a modernist, uh, as a, a sort of, um, as, as a painter that um, sort of is, is at the key of modernity. And I think that that to an extent might be true, but I do not believe at all that it was deliberately him doing that. I think it was, um, as I mentioned before, maybe um, the opportunity that that window that opened up because he did not have um, 
in his early days, uh, the surrounding of an academy and the restraint of an academy and maybe of a teacher that would, you know, say exactly how you had to paint and what you had to do. He was a little on his own. He was into stage design. He was into um, painting um, billboards and things like that. And he um, had all these techniques on hand and actually was free uh, to use them and use them. And um, um, But I don't want to go into, into this uh, further because I think it is a very complicated um, debate. Um, are the uh, Baike and uh, being viewed as a modernist. Um, but I wanted to stick to the phenomenon that so many people are fascinated by him. And I wanted to give you a few um, remarks I've heard on that. And uh, one is quite interesting uh, by a famous composer, uh, a conductor that you, many of you know, uh, Mr. Thielemann, who said that uh, he is reminded by these uh, landscapes of, uh, he's reminded of stage sets for Wagner's operas and uh, the, the, the drama in them, the, the light, the uh, rigorosity, the um, unruly nature. Um, that, um, uh, uh, that is what fascinates him and other people I think are fascinated. Uh, well, we've heard this by the void of these landscapes uh, by the dramatic exposure of uh, humanity to an unruly nature, uh, by the love of exaggeration that um, the artist has. If you please, uh, could you show me the other image? I think this one is actually um, makes my point when you think of a stage design or when you think of um, a sort of exaggerated lighting um, uh, that, that that does it. That's, um, what, that's what I'm referring to. And um, also um, this very free, uh, free application of paint, when you look at how he um, applies the whites, um, you have a feeling that they come directly from the tube. I mean, he didn't have one, but had he had one, he could have just sort of squirted it right on. It comes like toothpaste. And I think all these aspects um, appeal to us because we have uh, seen um, uh, the whole modern movement and we can see uh, in hindsight how Balke links in on that in a way. Um, but it's our modern eyes that actually um, are fascinated. And um, I can uh, somehow understand that um, uh, sort of traditional Norwegian public that maybe look to salon painting in Düsseldorf and uh, Paris would not be able to appreciate on a larger scale these paintings that are sort of wild. Um, and uh, uh, that's, that's uh, what uh, I can contribute here and I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Um, I would like to pass on now to um, the next uh, person on the panel, uh, whom you've already met, um, uh, Anthony Crichton Stewart, who um, made the introduction. Uh, Anthony uh, was raised and educated in England. Um, he worked as the head of Christie's Old Master Painting Department in New York for many years. Um, I think before at Christie's London, then in New York from 91 to 2006, and thereafter as an independent dealer in New York. And in 2014, he was involved in the acquisition of Agnus, one of the long-standing, uh, maybe the oldest British um, dealership, uh, art dealership. And uh, since then, he is director of Agnus, um, uh, in London uh, with a very nice gallery in Mayfair. Uh, he's a great connoisseur on Dutch and Flemish painting in the 17th century and has in recent years very successfully expanded his interest in his dealings into 19th century painting, British as well as European schools. And, and Anthony, uh, the stage is yours. 
Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm going to um, very briefly just say, before I talk about my two paintings, I think the, 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 the interest in, in, in Nordic painting, I mean, it's fascinating to think, to guess where it comes from and how far back. But I mean, I, there were very early collectors in, in plein air painting. And I think plan, if, you, if you bought plein air paintings, it kind of automatically led to an interest in Nordic. Uh, Nordic painting as well. So collectors like Jean Thor, John Gear, As von Lundy, who we've spoken about before, all helped with that. And then I think more recently, the interest in symbolist paintings has catapulted it to a whole nother level. Um, and then, of course, of course, art historians um, and, and museum curators have done an enormous amount to help that and to make the, um, the, the marketplace uh, sit up and pay attention. So, I mean, if you think about the National Gallery doing, you know, Danish painting, the Golden Age in 1984, uh, Kirk Varnado's 1988 book, Northern Light, uh, Nordic Art at the Turn of the Century, the various exhibitions on Hammershoy, the Royal Academy in 2008, and the Jacques Marandre in 2019, the fabulous Helene Schaffebeck uh, exhibition in 2019, of which it was said her self-portraits put her in the company of Rembrandt, Goya, Francis Bacon, and Lucien Freud, the fabulous Hilma Af Klint show at the Guggenheim in 2018-19, the Harold Solberg show at the Dulwich Picture Gallery in 2019, the various Munch shows, but most recently the uh, Edward, Munch, Edward Munch Love and Angst exhibition at the British Museum. And then a show I went to at the Musée d'Orsay called Wild Souls, Symbolism in the Baltic States. Artists from Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. I was very pleased I went around the entire show not having heard of a single artist, but it was fabulous. So. Going to um, my two pictures, divided by three years, the first one here, Hammershoy, 1888, um, one artist Danish, the other Norwegian, separated only by three years, but there's a gulf of difference between them. Um, Hammershoy has been called the poet of light and his paintings, the poetry of silence. And the white door, the image of which you're looking at, perfectly illustrates both these points. According to an interview published in Denmark in 1907, this was the first paint, the first empty room that Hammershoy depicted. And he painted it, as I said, in, in 1888 at the villa of a friend of his, the painter and art historian, Carl Madsen, who described Hammershoy's work as emotional realism. In the same 1907 interview, Hammershoy talked of his unique aesthetic awareness of empty rooms. I have always thought that there was such a beauty about a room like that, even though there wasn't any people, there weren't any people in it, perhaps precisely when there weren't any. In our painting, the room is deliberately empty, open and closed doors, suggesting, an ex ex suggesting existential choices. There is a sense of distance between us and the world in the painting, which is populated only by light. The jam stove in the corner of the room holds our attention, set against a grey wall next to an open door leading to a corridor and another closed door in an as yet unidentified space, bathed in a pure white light. The stove doesn't seem capable of performing its true function of radiating warmth, and its hulking black shape seems more like a sentinel whose job it is to stand and to keep watch. The artist has stripped the room down to its basic architectural structure and expunged all signs of life, leaving behind what has been described as a haunting tension, a trace of human drama. Hammershoy's atmospheric interiors, inconceivable without the influence of Dutch 17th century painting, particularly the work of, of Johannes Vermeer, are also indebted to the painters of the of the early 19th century Danish Golden Age, whilst at the same time placing the artist firmly in the context of contemporary European fin de siècle symbolist art. While his contemporaries were experimenting with colour in Paris, Hammershoy was developing an aesthetic of restraint using a very restricted palette. He worked on his canvases slowly, applying dryish paint in even brush strokes, layer upon layer, until he had captured all the tones of a single colour. His paintings comprise many layers of paint and the artist generally worked on a canvas for a long time, differentiating individual nuances of color and shade in the course of the painting process. 
he applied his relatively dry paint in short, even brushstrokes, pervading the entire canvas, the rhythmic brushstrokes blur contours and imbue his pictures with a restless, vibrant quality. Sometimes, just before he finished the painting, the canvas would cover the image with a fine veil of grey, enveloping the objects and their outlines in a mysterious gaze. In 1890, the Norwegian art critic Andreas Obert included Hammershoy, along with Whistler, Puvi de Chauvin, Max Klinger and Edvard Munch, amongst the new generation of decadent painters. Hermann Barr wrote in 1894, they all have one thing in common, a strong urge to move away from superficial and raw naturalism towards the depth of refined ideals. They do not seek art in externals. They do not wish to copy outward nature. They wish to model our inner universe. A fascinated Julius Elias wrote in 1916 that Hamashoi had succeeded in granting the most concrete and most commonplace things, a white, door, a short hallway, dust dancing in sunbeams, a quality not of this world, a reflection of sublime existence. His highly intense nervous life, his acutely sensitive emotional being, flourished only in this world of extreme simplicity and silence. Tones were what he loved and sought, the tones of stillness. He heard stillness, and that was where he really existed. So moving to three years later, and from Denmark to Norway, we have this painting by uh, the Norwegian artist Eilif Peterson, who was considered one of the pioneers in the development of Nordic landscape art. Like Balka, he traveled widely in Europe, including Munich, London, Paris, Venice, and Rome. His distinctive style of plein air subject matter evolved from his association first with the Danish artist Peter Severin Kroyer in the artist colony that developed in the fishing community of Skagen in Jutland, Denmark, and then in the summer of 1886 with fellow Norwegian artists on a farm in Fleskum in Norway, where, celebrated, where their work celebrated nature and the great outdoors. This picture, salmon fishers at Nisoya, executed in 1891, is a testimony to Peterson's position at the forefront of the development of Nordic landscape painting. It's a large size as well. It's 140 by 188 centimeters. It depicts a typically Nordic landscape on a warm summer's day with a verdant sun-drenched landscape, unlike the pure, almost symbolist landscapes which his fellow artists had been painting in Fleskum. The, lo the location depicted is the island of Nisoya, a wooded island located in the fjords not far from Oslo. The painting reveals Peterson at his most impressionistic, using broad strokes with thick impasto in the rocks, water, trees, and clothing of the fishermen, which are all executed in a dynamic, virtuoso, almost abstract dazzle of strokes. The artist uses a high viewpoint and creates a deceptively casual snapshot composition with only a small amount of sky visible, instead mostly reflected in the water to convey a mood of Nordic summer. The translucent light imbues the composition with an optimistic warmth and a sense of well-being that combines the spontaneity and bright colours of Impressionism with a provincial motif that celebrates the innocent rustic charm of summers spent in the Norwegian fjords. Layered with national pride, the painting is a poignant expression of simple values and a healthy lifestyle in a rural idyll that recalls nuances Peterson first explored in his masterpiece, Summer Night of 1886, in the National Museum of Art, Architecture and Design in Oslo, Norway. So I'd now like to pass on um, the baton to William Mitchell, who's the director of John Mitchell Fine Paintings, a family owned dealership associated with traditional British European paintings for 90 years. With a gallery in the heart of London's Mayfair, the gallery has a rich history of finding works for museums and international private collectors alike, holding regular exhibitions and participating in a selection of art fairs. As well as a long-standing interest in old masters, William has become an acknowledged specialist in French, Swiss and German paintings of the Alps, and in winter 2021, the gallery will put on its 20th annual exhibition devoted to Alpine art, peaks and glaciers. 
In 2018, William wrote and published a book about the French painter and mountaineer Gabriel Lope, and is currently writing the first monograph in English on Alexander Calam, the leading Swiss landscapist of the 19th century. William, last year you did an exhibition on fjords and forests during London Art Week. Wild nature is something that is very much key to Balke's work, perhaps, but perhaps you can share its importance for other European artists. Um, well, thank you, Anthony, um, for that absolutely glowing introduction. Uh, the exhibition I did, indeed, it veered away from the topic that we've been on today from Nordic art, further down across the Germanic plains and through the forests of Middle Europe. It ended up tying uh, a connection between the North and Switzerland. And there's been a, a lot of study in the last, I'd say, 15 years about the connection between some of these Nordic artists and Swiss artists. And it's, 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 you have to, I suppose, look at it. The northern wilderness is these wastes and huge mountainous coastlines. You then go south and you traverse a very flat part of Europe and you traverse forests and forests to arrive in Switzerland, a kingdom of mountains and valleys, and absolutely extraordinary landscapes, both of them. But really one of the unifiers is this enormous forest, which in the 19th century would have been still very viable, a great these great swathes of forests, which, which really uh, in folklore and German art are so important and was picked up. And one of the themes that pervades through all of this romantic painting is these great stately trees, particularly in German and Swiss painting, less so potentially in, in Norwegian. But as Marcus showed us that beautiful little balka of the trees and their role, the trees, to be clear, in, in my view, in many ways, replace the depiction of people. The trees were the ultimate symbol of people in these wild landscapes. But um, I think what we, and I, I'm really not going to talk for very long at all, but it's, um, I would just say that one of the things that's been thrown up today, beginning right back at Knut's uh, wonderful talk about his book, there's a lot of contradictions that are coming out of this because even the word romantic is sort of now being kind of examined a bit more closely today, just in this talk, because I think, yes, these artists, through their aesthetic experience, they had a revelation of faith and, and they put that down on whether it was in an oil sketch, a drawing, a painting. That was what they had in common. But geography and the fact that they were citizens of their time and nations played an enormous role in who got the lucky break. Now, Knut mentioned Balka having to leave Norway to go off to his academy. Um, an artist that I'm particularly interested in, and he will come up, I think, in the next slide, in, Alexandre Kalam, who was a, a very successful, unlike Balke, he found success early on. But again, Kalam was forced to move away from his native Geneva to gain recognition. Now, it's ironic, we've talked about forests and great Cap Nord, Nordcap and these beautiful fjords and uh, Norway, these great valleys in Switzerland. But uh, the only place these people seem to have been able to create some fame for themselves is in a flat alluvial plain of Paris in, in northern France. And it's amazing again through the 19th century how many roads in all the art we study lead to Paris. Now, if we start briefly back in 1823 or 4 when Constable was recognized in the Salon, seen by the great romantic painter Delacroix, if you think um, Balka was a very young, he was just a teenager when that picture was shown. Um, Kalam was but 10 years old. And then in 1839 and 1840, when Kalam, this, this artist illustrated here, this is a preparatory sketch for a massive uh, salon painting of two meters that he showed in Paris in 1840. Who was it that came and bought? Not this picture, but its companion piece was Louis Philippe. And I was fascinated to, to, to bring together, to see bring brought together today um, that Louis Philippe played such a role. If you think of Balka trying to get his audience with the king, you think of Biard being sponsored to go up to the far, far west of Spitsbergen, um, or Svalbard, if, if we can call it that, and, and then him buying Kalam. And in a way, had Louis Philippe stayed on the throne, had there not been a revolution, it's tempting to think, um, where would these artists have gone? Would they have become almost royal under royal patronage and um, I think what we can take away from today is that the fact that Balka wasn't successful 
and that Louis Philippe uh, ended up being booted out. I think it's it's fascinating because Balker actually, because he wasn't successful, became almost far more creative. Now, poor old Kalam, in a way, um, I say poor old Kalam because he was too successful, too young, and was forced to produce an enormous amount of pictures on commission. And when he died in 1864, uh, all the oil studies and the finished oil sketches from his studio were put up for auction in the Drew in, in Paris. And there were over 500 of them. And when you see them today, they're not just small da daubs on canvas. They're, most of them are finished small sketches like this picture here. And I often wonder whether these great academies like the Dusseldorf Academy, uh, of whom the, the previous um, artist Lou was a was, was a member alongside Aschenbach and Schirmer and these great German landscape masters. Uh, I, I wonder whether the straitjacket of their training in the academy had meant that they were never quite able to, to produce these things that you see in Balka. This almost, I mean, uh, Knut mentioned modern, but I mean, and, and Marcus was wary of understandably calling him a modern artist. He's not at all, he's born um, practically just at the beginning of the 19th century. But I think his approach was because he, his training was, was limited, whereas Kalam underwent um, the customary trip to Paris to study in the Louvre, just as all the Dusseldorf artists did. And so I think there's, um, there's a whole contradiction about what, we, what we're, are these artists products of their countries and products of their geography. Yes, they are, but they relied on these enormous structures of the salon and the official way to become recognized. And I think to, to end my small contribution, I'm, I'm heartened to see um, what all these museum exhibitions have done. And above all, this, this talk shows, um, and this is talking from an art dealer's point of view, that with, I suppose, a bit of... Um, intellectual independence, some imagination, not too much, but a bit of scholarship and study. Uh, Knut's talk and, and looking at the Gunderson collection and a collection that I was involved with that was, um, as we mentioned before, Aspen Lundy's collection, who had the, the largest collection of paintings by Kalam in private hands. He had many paintings by Dahl and Balka, but it came relatively late in his life. He only started collecting in the 90s all these pictures we've looked at today um, have been collected in a relatively short time frame. And um, the other thing which is a bit crass, but Knut mentioned Rothko, uh, you could buy all of these pictures and you wouldn't approach be able to scratch the surface of buying yourself a Rothko. And I, I know it's, it's, um, it's an unpopular viewpoint, but it, it's, it, this is proof what you can do. Uh, you can find new areas of correcting, as Marcus said, and, I think it's a fascinating, I think there's a great future to learn from this. Uh, there are museum exhibitions that should be worthy of being plugged now. There's one in Zurich called in Herzenfeld, Wild at Heart, which is just opened at the Zurich Kunsthaus. It's on until February. There's a great exhibition just opening in Germany in the Kunstpalast in Dusseldorf, all about the relationship between Friedrich and um, the Dusseldorf School, which was an enormous influence on landscape painting in the 19th century. And I think it's a mild achievement. We've managed to, to get through this entire talk with only one mention of Turner. Um, but I think we have to mention, uh, not that I have to mention it, but there is a, another Turner exhibition coming up. And I think if this proves anything, it shows that there is definitely life beyond uh, Turner. We've been able to talk about all of this without having to get him involved. And uh, it won't get me an invitation to the opening, but it, it, he's a wildly overexposed artist when you look at some of the things we've been looking at today. Um, so to summarise, Knut, your book talk was fantastic, and I've really enjoyed my fellow panellists talking about this. And um, I'm just going to finish. We've got a question here um, out of the ether from um, New York, and it's from Asha Miller at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's a very good question to you, Knut, if you could answer it for us, um, you, 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 if you could unmute. It's just simply that with so little, apart from biographical detail to look at, um, Ash's question to you is, how do you put together your book and individually look at each picture when you're just working from biographical detail? And it's a thought that occurred to me, how do you 
assess who this Balkhor was. And, and we, we it, I think it, there is such a change as well through his work. So it would be interesting to hear how you've done it. Thank you, William. Um, and thank you, Asher, in New York for a highly relevant and interesting question. Uh, and uh, for those of you who, most of you are, know Asher Miller, I suppose. Asher is a curator in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he uh, organized a Balke show in, was it 18, seven, nine, sorry, 2017? Uh, with works as basically from American collections, including uh, the Lunda collection and also the Hearn family trusts. So, so uh, you, you, you are, like Chris and I, familiar with the challenges, uh, Asher, so it's a highly relevant question. And of course, I had the advantage when working on the Gundersen collection and this book that I've been working with Balke for some time now, you know, and, and not in least in connection with uh, the 2014 exhibition in London and Tromsø, where of course we also met these challenges because a few, very few of his paintings are dated. And there has been a lot of questions and discussions about his datings and his development as an artist, but also about his influences, which context to look at upon him. So that has been really one of the great tasks I set to do and it has been very interesting sitting with the images trying to group them in period together with 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 with, with colleagues and i think we are closer now to the dating i think that is one obvious thing i think we can see a very distinct development more distinct than perhaps we believed based on the few works that are dated and the many that are not that you know you have after Paris and Louis Philippe, you get more and more the monochrome style. Uh, then in you get uh, in the, the 60s, you get the very white canvas. And then in the 70s, probably the, the, the small block, black and white monochromes again, uh, which are highly experimental for their time, whether we, whether we go into the discussion of if he was a romantic or a modern artist. Uh, and another thing that I have found very interesting is I try to organize the book not strictly chronologically but more thematically then there is a certain chronology at the core uh, to look at Balke in different contexts to discuss the works to go in depth with what did he learn from his teacher in Stockholm Karl Johan Falkrans what are the relations he wrote very positively about Falkrans for instance while Later art historians have tended to, if not ignore, so at least downplay Falkland's importance. That might have something to do with a national history writing of Norway. It was very important to, to attach him to the school of Dahl as the great national hero, I, I think. And then, of course, also the connection with Dahl and Friedrich, which have been known, but which I have also looked further into. But I, I've also been thought it very interesting to look at the possible connection to Turner. And I think we cannot disregard that anymore. I mean, he was in London, he must have seen some of these works. And an analysis where we compare these works makes that very, those connections very in, uh, interesting to me. And of course, it's not a popular thing to say about an artist that he or she was influenced by or, or inspired by, but it's there, and there are perhaps more like parallels, but it's still there, you know, that Turner and Balke, they try to achieve, achieve some of the same things, their, their depiction of light and atmospheric conditions with more and more experimental means, with more and more monochrome scales. So I think, I, I hope you have received your copy of the book yet, Asher, because, and you will see these things. And this is also the foundation for the, Further project, which of course is the catalogue resume on Peter Balkia. And that is something that we have initiated in the Nordic Institute of Art. That project is still in its uh, infancy, but uh, with me as the chief editor, we, it, will, it will be a project that will take some time. Obviously, you all understand that that is a long term project. 
So for now you have to, I suppose, go to the, to the present publication. Well, so yes, that was an enlarged, that was a long answer to a very short and good question. Well, thank you very much, Knut. Um, I'm very, very much looking forward to reading your book. And I think there's a lot more that we're going to learn going forward. And I hope we can do this again. Um, so it just remains to me to thank our fellow panelists and for all their contribution. And um, to remind everybody that London Art Week Digital runs from the 27th of November to the 11th of December. And galleries are, of course, expecting to open from the lockdown on the 3rd of December and uh, when lockdown is over. And I hope you'll join us for um, the online talks, the London Art Week Symposium on Raphael.